All right, welcome back, fellow scientists. So let's review. Chapter 12, DNA. Chapter 13, transcription translation. Now we're moving on to chapter 15. So chapter 12 was all about, okay, what is the genetic material? How does it work? Um, how, does it, how does it copy itself so that each daughter cell can have its own copy um, of the information that it needs? Chapter 13, okay, now that we know um, how it copies itself, how do we put that information to work? It's a two-step process, transcription, translation, right? So now we're venturing into chapter 15, which I am going to title Biotechnology. So biotechnology, the way that we're going to define it is manipulating DNA to benefit humans, right? So you can bio, right, life, and then technology, like new stuff that you can do, right? So technically, there's a lot more to biotechnology than just manipulating DNA. Um, but that's what we're going to focus on in this course. So in this video, we're going to look at one tool and one process um, of biotechnology. So our first tool is called restriction enzymes. So go ahead and write that down, restriction enzymes. Um, and what restriction enzymes do is they're little proteins. Remember, proteins, enzymes, are the workers in our bodies, right? They're the class of macromolecules that actually do stuff. Um, and so what the proteins do, what the enzymes do, is they'll clamp onto the double helix of DNA, and they'll run down the double helix, <clears throat> and they will look for a specific sequence. Now, what do I mean when I say specific sequence? Well, I mean a specific order of A's and C's and T's and G's, right? And we'll see that. I'll give you examples here in a second. But once they find that specific order, then they are going to cut through the sugar phosphate backbone, and they're going to make two different fragments um, of, our, of our DNA. So first restriction enzyme that we're going to look at, these have pretty funky names, and I'll talk about that here in a second. But first restriction enzyme is... No row one, okay? So you gotta imagine, we have our double helix, and I'm gonna draw it kinda like I did for DNA replication and transcription and translation, just because it's a double helix, yes, but I need to be able to write down the bases so that we can actually see them. So no row one is an enzyme that's gonna clamp onto the DNA, and it's gonna run down the strand of DNA, and it's gonna look for this sequence, A, T, T, A, right? So opposite that is T, A, A, T, like that. And once it finds that, molecular scissors are just going to shoo, right through the middle of that sequence, sugar phosphate backbone and everything. So now we have two fragments. So now we have two fragments. One fragment looks like this. It has A, T, so that would be T, A. Uh, and then the other fragment, right, looks like this. So we have T, A, and A, T. That's an A, by the way. Um, so two separate pieces of DNA, right? No row one. Um, another enzyme that we're going to talk about is small one. S, M, A. Small one. Okay, so I'm not going to draw the double helix. You guys know that it's there. I'm just going to draw our two sugar phosphate backbones, right? So small one clamps on, runs down, looks for the sequence. C, C, C. G, 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 so opposite that, of course, G, 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 C, 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 and it's going to cut right straight down the middle. All right, so no row one and small one are two restriction enzymes that give us what we call blunt ends. Blunt is usually referred to as the opposite of sharp. Uh, in biotechnology, blunt is the opposite of sticky, okay? So blunt ends mean that at the very end of our fragment, both bases are paired up. We have no unpaired bases. All of our bases have pairs, and they're hydrogen bonding, and they're happy, okay? So no row one, small one, produce blunt ends. Uh, our two other enzymes that we're going to talk about produce what are called sticky ends, okay? So these are blunt ends, right, right here. Um, and then our next one is probably the most famous restriction enzyme of all time is ECO, E-C-O-R-1. All right, so ECO-R1, restriction enzymes are named for the bacteria in which they're found, right? Um, restriction enzymes are naturally occurring in bacteria, and it's kind of like the bacteria's immune system against viruses, right? We already learned virus injects DNA, the DNA takes over the bacteria, the viral DNA takes over the bacteria, um, and then it makes more virus parts, and then the 
bacteria explodes, which isn't good for the bacteria. So the bacteria doesn't want the virus DNA in there. So E. coli R1 comes from probably the most famous bacteria ever, E. coli, right? E. coli and restriction enzyme 1 because it was the first restriction enzyme that was isolated from the bacteria E. coli. So E. coli R1 is an enzyme, is a protein that's going to clamp onto a strand and it's going to run down the strand and look for this sequence, G-A-A-T-T-C. G-A-A-T-T-C, right? So then C-T-T-A-A-G, okay? And it's not going to cut straight through the middle. It is going to very delicately slice through this sugar phosphate backbone between the G and the A. Then it's going to slice through this sugar phosphate backbone between the G and the A. And then it's going to slice through the things that are holding the bases together, which we know are... Yes, exactly. Hydrogen bonds. So then what we get is something that looks like this. So we're going to get one fragment that has a G on this side, but then on this side there's a C and a T and a T and an A and an A, just like that. And then the other fragment is going to look something like this. There's going to be a G on this side and then a C and a T and a T and an A and an A on this side. So these are not blunt ends, these are sticky ends because we have four unpaired bases that want to pair with something. They're like little magnets. They want to form their hydrogen bonds, right? So that's EGOR1. And then the last restriction enzyme we're going to talk about and that we're going to use in class is HIND3. Um, oops, H-I-N-D. Man, I look like a kindergartner writing. This is horrible. <laughs> I'm not. You can see my picture. <laughs> I'm actually 36 years old. <laughs> it's this computer software, the lovely computer software. All right, so Hind3, one of my students always posts, I do mine, mine in crayon, right, because it looks like Mr. Leo's writing with his left foot. I know, I know. Okay, so Hind3. Um, so here we go. So we have our DNA, and it's going to clamp on, and it's going to search for this sequence, A, A, G, yep, C. A, A, is it? Yeah, A, A, G, C, T, T. Um, so opposite that is T, T, C, G, A, A, T, T, C, G, A, A. Um, and then it's going to cut between the two A's. So cut this sugar phosphate backbone, cut this sugar phosphate backbone, and then break the hydrogen bonds um, in between to give us two sticky ends. Okay, so that is our first tool of biotechnology restriction enzymes. All right, and we'll do we'll do a little bit more in class with this. So then our next thing that we're going to talk about, come on, little mouse. All right, uh, is our first process. So first tool, restriction enzymes. First process is transformation. So transformation, there are probably other definitions out there, but the way we're going to define it is making a cell produce something that it normally does not. Okay, now remember the central dogma of biology, right? We have DNA and then RNA and then proteins, um, and then that makes you, okay? So when we're talking about a cell producing something, cells are producing proteins for the most part. So we're talking about producing a protein. So what we do, and I'm going to use a, a two different colors here, okay? So let's say that we have someone who has diabetes, right? A diabetic person needs insulin. Well, where do you get that insulin from? Well, before we had this process of transformation of biotechnology, then um, pharmaceutical companies would have to go to slaughterhouses and get the discarded pancreas, I think that's the plural of pancreas. Uh, get the discarded pancreas from sheep and cows. Sheep. <laughs> what am I doing? From sheep and cows and pigs and all of those all of those food animals, right? And so then they'd extract the insulin from the from the pancreas, um, and then and then that's where they would get insulin. Well, you'd need to kill a lot of animals to get um, to get the amount of insulin that, that patients need. So along comes biotechnology to the rescue. So let's say that we have a human. Right, natural resource. There's a lot of them. There's like seven billion on the planet right now. That you have man. a human, and let's say it's a it's a normal human uh, who makes insulin, makes insulin well. So we're gonna cut. Um, we're gonna find the insulin gene. I N S U 
find the insulin gene, and we're going to cut it with an enzyme that produces sticky ends. Okay? I'm not going to draw it double-stranded because then it would just get too confusing. But we're going to cut out the human insulin gene, right? And then we're going to have a bacteria. Well, actually, we're going to have the DNA from a bacteria. Remember, human DNA is linear. Bacterial DNA is circular. And so then we're going to cut this bacterial DNA with the same restriction enzyme. That's key, the same restriction enzyme. So then what we do is we take our bacteria DNA that we cut with EcoR1, and we take our human DNA that we cut with EcoR1. Those sticky ends are going to join up, and we'll do a little, a little activity in class, and this will make a little bit more sense. Those sticky ends are going to join up, and so now all of a sudden we have the gene the series of letters that makes the human protein insulin, okay? So what we do with this then, this, so this is just DNA. This by itself, you know, can't do anything. But now what we're going to do is now we are going to put it into a bacteria, right? And so we're going to take this, and this, by the way, little small circular piece of DNA is known as a plasmid, right? So we're going to take this little plasmid, and we are going to put it into the bacteria, um, and now we have a bacteria that makes insulin. So now we don't have to go to slaughterhouses and get the discarded remains from sheep and cows and pigs and stuff like that. But we just have a bunch of these bacteria and we can make all of the insulin that we want, right? Okay, Mr. Leo, that's cool, but come on, that's, that's not very impressive. Okay, so check this out. So let's say that we have a jellyfish that makes a protein that makes it uh, green, that makes it fluorescent, uh, it glows green under ultraviolet light. So let's say that we take that, we take that gene, um, it's called the GFP, the green fluorescent protein, um, we take that gene out of the jellyfish, well, what do you want to put it in? Well, let's try putting it in bacteria first, okay? So this, these are normal E. coli, and then these are all right, so this is what E. coli normally looks like. And then this is these little glowing spots. That's E. coli, but those have been transformed with the gene from the jellyfish to make them glow green. Okay, fine, Mr. Leo, bacteria, whatever. I'm still not impressed. Okay, what about if we did it to fish? You can go buy glowing fish at the pet store because of this green fluorescent protein that we can put in. Okay, well, that's kind of cool. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, well, what if we did it to mice? Oh. Well, now we're up into mammals. Well, what if we did it to rabbits? Ooh, that's kind of cool. It would uh, not be good to be the rabbit trying to hide from a hawk if you're glowing green, but that's okay. We don't release these out into the wild, right? Chimpanzee? Monkey? Glowing green? Yes, we can do it. Um, and it's it's cool to make, you know, glowing animals and, and to see that it works, uh, but... That's not really helping us advance medical science. What is helping us advance medical science is we can actually take that gene and we can attach it to another gene so that if gene one is active, then the green fluorescent protein gene is active, okay? And we do this especially with embryology, the study of embryos, to see how embryos grow and develop, what genes are producing what proteins, and if a gene is not producing a protein, then what birth defect does it cause, right? So we can, we can attach the green fluorescent protein gene to another gene, and then we can insert it into a one-celled embryo. Um, and by the way, these are not human embryos. We don't, we don't do these trials on, on human embryos, but we might use like mouse embryos or chicken embryos or, or something like that, something that's, that's easily visible and that's uh, not very ethically controversial. Um, so we can attach that green fluorescent protein, and now all of a sudden we can see where that gene is active. So it's a, it's a, it's a really cool, really cool idea, really cool tool. So let's review very quickly. Chapter 12, DNA. Chapter 13, transcription translation. Chapter 15, biotechnology. Our first tool was restriction enzymes, cuts DNA in specific sequences. And our first process was transformation, making a cell produce something that it normally doesn't, like bacteria producing insulin, or like bacteria, or fish, or mice, or rabbits, or chimpanzees uh, producing the green fluorescent protein. So that's it for me. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you on the flip side.